Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome from the Authors Guild Foundation. In our series, Business Bootcamps for Writers, we cover a variety of topics about today's paths to publication and how to manage your business and grow your career as an author. And this event, we're combining our boot camps with another long running series of ours from manuscript to marketplace, which offers case studies of the current publishing experience. We'll do a few more in this vein, featuring authors at various career stages and who write in different genres. So we'll, we'll cover a lot of angles. But today, we're very excited to hear from Ali Bilal, her agent, Eric Simonoff, and her editor, Yadon Israel about Aliyah's, Aliyah's forthcoming collection of short stories, Temple Folk. Uh, Business Boot Camps for Writers is made possible by support from the National Endowment for the Arts and by Penguin Random House. Uh, we thank them and all our donors who enable us to do these programs uh, free for the public. Uh, today's event was specially produced in partnership with the Asian American Writers Workshop, and you can learn more about them at aaww.org. So thank you to them, and in particular, our moderator today, Lily Philpott. She's the Director of Programs and Partnerships at the Asian American Writers Workshop. She has many years of experience curating literary programs in New York City, including at PEN America, the Guggenheim, and the Public Library. She's a member of the Brooklyn Book Festival's International Literature Committee and the Starlinks Collective of BIPOC adoptee writers and artists. And she's a candidate for MFA in fiction at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Uh, with that, Lily, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Johnny. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I am going to briefly introduce Alia, Yadon, and Eric, and then we're going to get straight into conversation. Uh, we will have a little bit of time for Q&A at the end of our hour, um, just as a heads up, so please do think on some questions. Uh, Alia Villal writes fiction and nonfiction, a graduate of Oberlin College and the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. Her work has appeared in the Rumpus and the Michigan Quarterly Review. Temple Folk is her first collection of short stories and will be released on July 4th, 2023. Please mark your calendars, make sure to pre-order. Yadon Israel is a senior editor at Simon & Schuster and the founder of Literary Swag, a cultural movement that intersects literature and fashion to make books accessible. He has written for The New Inquiry, Lit Hub, Poets and Writers, Vanity Fair, and The Atlantic. He teaches creative writing at the MFA program at City College and hosts the Literary Swag Book Club, a Brooklyn-based subscription service and book club that meets every last Wednesday of the month. And Eric Simonoff is a literary agent and partner at WME. His clients include Ya Jesse, Jimpa Lahiri, Donathan Lethem, Phil Kwai, Zizi Packer, Mega Majumdar, Daniel Alarcon, Jean Kyung Fraser, Chanji Li Wong, Vikr Vikram Chandra, Alia Bilal, Alia Bilal, excuse me, and many, many others. He serves on the board of trustees of the Poets and Writers Organization and is the recipient of the Center for Fiction Medal for Editorial Excellence. So thank you all again so much for being here. Um, I'm really excited that we could have all three of you because I actually became aware of this kind of network of connections through social media, through Yadon's um, Instagram post about how the book was acquired, discovered, how you all came together. So I'd actually love to start our conversation off with a little bit of sort of storytelling for the audience um, on how Temple Folk was acquired and came to be. Um, and Alia, I'd love to start with you. If you could talk us about kind of the creative side of it. Um, what is, you know, the seed from which this collection grew? If you have an elevator pitch, if you can deliver it now, I'd love to just hear a little bit about the book. Sure. Well, first of all, I'm really grateful and happy to be with you all today. As far as the seed, you know, I grew up Muslim in a community that grew out of the Nation of Islam. And it's... Um, always been my ambition to write serious fiction about, you know, my experiences growing up in this community. And um, yeah, awesome. my elevator pitch would be, you know, if you have any curiosity about the Nation of Islam and its second iteration, the time span being pretty much like the emergence of Malcolm to the death of Elijah Muhammad and the Sunni Muslim community that grew out of the nation of Islam, out of that experience, then read this book. Awesome. Thank you. Um, 
And Yadon, can you tell us a little bit about um, the books you were hoping to acquire when you joined Simon and Schuster? Um, how you became aware of Alia's work, and I mean, maybe a little bit more specifically. I know you did some really amazing Instagram Live conversations when you first joined Simon and Schuster to really open up that conversation and make it clear to your audience, to the literary community, what kind of work you were hoping to celebrate. Um, but yeah, I can that. absolutely talk about that. I just want to just break the fourth wall and just say, like, when you read all three of those bios together, it just it's like a winning team. Like it's, it's it's exciting. Like I can't hold, contain my joy. Super like, sorry. The first time we us three are here to talk about this book with other people besides us three. So I'm just excited. Um, so I got this job last year, March 22nd. I remember dates because like, I think when there's a, in most days in your life, nothing really happens, right? There's an, there's a cumulative effect where like over the course of time, something happens. But here is where like there were clear before and after moments that's just like very seared, like seared into my brain. So March 22nd, I started the job. That's a Monday. I remember talking to the editorial director, like within two days of being there, I remember Dana Kennedy, uh, who hired me along with John Carp. She was like, OK, you're a senior editor, your job. We expect you to acquire eight to 12 books. They didn't give me they didn't tell me how they was just like go do that. And I was like, I, don't, I was like, okay. So I, in my mind, I'm like, all right, like how am I going to acquire eight to 12 books in a year with no blueprint? And it, and there was a standard of how you go about, you know, you take agent lunches, you, you meet with people and the expectation I come to find out later, but was, I wasn't expected. I was expected to cultivate the relationship that would enable me to acquire eight to 12 books. I took it very literally as like, we want to see eight to 12 books. So I was talking to an executive editor and I was trying to gauge what the, my reach was as a new employee, as a new person from outside the industry. And I asked the editor a question around, like, if you could do any book you haven't done yet, who would it be? And she shared who she wanted to be. And I'd like tossed out like, I would want to do a Dave Chappelle book just to see if she was going to say something like, you know what you're done, you know, walk before you run. That's you know, she said, well, if you know how to get in touch with him, make it happen. And I was like, wait, so y'all just going to let me y'all giving me the keys to the building. I took that conversation and I went straight to Instagram live and it was more or less like, oh, we have resources. They are they are letting me do what I think I'm here to do. And knowing that. How do we, you know, me having a seat at this table that cause, that's called publishing, one of the things I immediately realized, if they're bringing people from outside the industry, if I'm only bringing the kind of books that everyone else in the industry would see, I just personally believe for myself, I'm not saying this for anybody else in this industry, I believe I didn't deserve a table, a, a seat. Because if I'm seeing what everyone else is seeing, it's like, what am I actually appending? What am I changing? What am I radicalizing here. So I was like, I want to be able to get the kind of books that no one in the house is seeing, no one in publishing is seeing. It's like, well, how do you do that? It's like, I'm going to Instagram, right? I want to jump over MFA programs. I want to jump over the trajectories where like, once you kind of get an agent, you're on, you're on a path, right? So it doesn't mean that because you have an agent and because you have an MFA, publication is all but imminent. What it also means is that there were there are many people, and I took this from my own experience navigating publishing when I thought I was a writer, and I found out I wasn't. Um, and I had meetings with agents and editors who would constantly tell me that the ideas that I wanted to do for books would not sell. And so I just extrapolated, like, if I got told that, and I thought I was pretty dope, like, there are a lot of people out here who don't have agents, who don't have MFAs, and they're like, there's no way to find them. And it's like, how do you find them? So I saw the Instagram live video as like a flare in the air. At that time, I had about like 12,000 followers. I was pretty known because of my work with literary swag and like, you know, being a literary citizen for my advocacy around book publishing, writers and, and et cetera. So I was like, this should reach pretty, this should reach enough people. I had no idea and was not prepared at all for the reach. So I was like, I did the video like 2 p.m. Um, I posted a, I, I did a post that was like, I'm doing a video. 
And I just remember being on live and like the same way I'm looking at the participants and seeing that there's 276 people on here. I was like watching and usually my lives never went above like 50 on a good day. It was a hundred. And I watched that thing just climb as I'm talking and I'm trying to focus. And I'm like, this number keeps going up and up and up. And the only thing that really changed, I mean, a lot changed because I had institutional power. But if you think about when I didn't have that job or didn't publicly announce it, it was literally a week ago. Right. That I went from somebody who had a job that couldn't speak about it and then had this job and then could say, I want to, you know, I want to publish work that people aren't representing that that we can't find. And so I did that video. That video garnered like 24,000 views in like a week's time. Over that week's time, I got over like 500 submissions for books that I'm still reading. So if you're on this uh, event wondering when I'm going to get back to you, I promise I'm going to get back to you. Um, but I remember one of the submissions being coming from Aliyah. And it was very, what's the word, like unassuming. It was like, I wish I thought to have the email up so to read it, but it was just like, hi, like, and I'm, I'm like, I have this collection, you know, it's about black Muslims. I hope you enjoy. It was just like, it wasn't even like this whole, like, this is going to change the world. It was just like, I got, got some stories. Tell me what you think. And I remember opening the collection and the first thing I saw was the Gordon Parks uh, photo of the, the the black women in the in the, in the in the nation in the nation, and it was like it's a striking photo for anyone who doesn't know it. And so I scrolled down. I remember reading the first like paragraph, and I was like, I know these people. Mm. And then when I kept reading, I was like, There's a moment that happens, and I'm, and Eric, you could probably talk to this as an agent, but there's a moment that happens where I like you're reading. And then my legs started bouncing. And when I, I paid attention to my legs start bouncing, it was almost like seeing like a gold bar across the street and you see it. And all you're trying to do is get to it before anyone else does. So you don't want to break eye contact with the bar because you don't want to lose sight of it, but you don't want to draw attention to it because you're afraid you'll lose it. And I'm like, this woman is brilliant. I have to figure out how to get this, I, I, I got to figure out how to, and so I think I emailed you, Aliyah, like a day later, or the, I was like, listen, I don't know where you live, I don't know if, you, I thought you were in Shanghai at a point, and I was like, well, we got to get on the phone, we got to talk about this, and I told her, I was like, these stories are brilliant, and I, and I, amongst, among many things I told her, I said, whoever you want to represent this book, tell them you have an offer, like, now, I want to be transparent, that I had not even talked to anyone in publishing about the book yet. No one at the house even knew that I had seen this, but coming back to what I said about being at that table, it was like, this was a book that I was willing to lose my job that I had just gotten over. Like if I can't publish this, I don't need to be here. So that's how confident I was when I read it is like, this is why I got this job. This is why I did the video. And this is, this is why I'm actually in this industry. So like, that was, that was the, like, you know, the too long didn't read um, linear way that that happened was just like, yeah. And so I remember being on the phone with an agent that Aliyah thought she was going to be represented by then getting an email from her while I was on the phone with said agent saying, Hey, Eric Simonoff just signed on, just signed on to be my agent. I'll put you in touch soon. And I'm like, who's Eric Simonoff? Still new to the industry, didn't know. So I Google him and the thing comes up and Phil Clyde and Yah Jesse is his clients. And the first thing I thought, and I, I tell a story too many times to, to, to talk about, but I'm like, oh man, I'm gonna lose this book. Cause in my head, I'm thinking, this is Eric Simonoff. This dude is representing every great fiction writer or short story like and I'm like I'm, I'm I done talked myself out of this book and so from that point I met with Eric I was really honest about what I'm saying like thinking I was gonna lose the book but I'm, I'm gonna try and then we made the deal um and I let Eric take the rest from here but like this is that was really what happened it was it was taking a chance on I guess the, the, I guess the, the most succinct way to say it is like taking that risk of doing the kind of work that while scary is ultimately worth it. Yeah, that's so, I mean, it's amazing to hear. I have 
chills, like actual chills from just hearing how this all came together. And I'm so grateful always, Yadon, for your willingness to make space at the table, break this fourth wall and the opacity that often surrounds the publishing world and just bring us all in. Um, and Eric, I'd love to ask you to kind of close the loop for us on this, you know, origin myth that we're telling. Um, tell us about that, your first interactions with Alia, with Yadon. Um, sure. Yeah. Happened? So um, I'm, I'm married to a brilliant literary agent named Meredith Cafel Simonoff, who represents Brandon Taylor and Dontiel Moniz and Nana Kwame Aji Brenya, and Melissa Broder, and all kinds of Jasmine Chan, incredible writers. And she said, and we, we heard about Yudan's new job, and she said, hey, this guy Yudan's doing this Instagram Live thing. Uh, we should check it out. So we were among the 25,000 people who mm -hmm. logged on to watch it. It was, and how long were you on? You done like an hour and twenty minutes? It was like yeah, I did. I did about a. I did about a. I did, I did about a, a night at the yeah. <laughs> did a solo show. And, that was... and uh, we were we were blown away uh, by yeah by as Louis said the transparency, the directness, the as they say in the business, disintermediating of everything between the writer and the editor. Uh, and I remember thinking like, oh, this guy is going to get completely swamped. He's going to get 25,000 submissions in his inbox tomorrow. But then I also noticed, Yadon, that you were very specific, specific about what you didn't want to see. You were as clear about, you know, like, don't bother and send me the following, as you were saying what you really did want to see and, and the parameters of the job that you, you wanted books that people would really connect with. Um, and then I forget how much later on, a few days, I guess, or more, uh, I got an email from Alia saying, I'm writing this collection, Temple Folk. There's an editor who's expressed interest and says he he definitely wants to offer. Um, Alia, do you remember, did you reference Ed Jones in that letter? I can't remember. Um, anyway, you know, I get a lot of submissions. I read all my submissions myself. Uh, I don't take a lot on these days, but I'm always looking because the most fun and interesting part of the job is uh, getting into the ground floor and really being part of the, the beginning of an amazing literary career. Um, but it doesn't happen every day. Uh, and I mean, for the 300 people on the, on the call, I'm, I'm open to, for submissions. Uh, you'd be surprised how, how few really remarkable ones I, I see. Um, but I began reading the stories and I had the same experience Yudan did, which was a, a recognition, immediate recognition that I was in the hands of a consummate storyteller and someone who really understood the, the, the use and power of language uh, and someone who understood her characters and understood where she was taking her characters. And one of the things that Meredith and I spent a lot of time talking about because we're both crazy enough to represent a lot of short story writers is um, something that we call aboutness. That is, are, are these stories about something? And every one of the stories has this sort of fundamental aboutness to it, that uh, an, an incredible intentionality and a recognition by uh, the author that she knows where she wants to take these characters and what story she wants to tell the reader. So I was I was in, uh, and Alia and I connected, and then the question really for Alia was, what do you want to do? Because uh, there were a couple of different paths we could take. One was. Um, see if we could work something out with Yadon and Simon and Schuster. And the other was sit tight, wait till the whole collection was finished because there were a few more stories that Alia wanted to write and then blast it out to, you know, all the major uh, editors and publishers of, of serious literary fiction in, in New York. Um, and I can turn it over to, to Alia at that point, I think. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear, Alia, just how... I mean, actually, a couple of questions. Going back to what Yadon was saying about the email you initially sent, um, it's so fascinating to hear him describe it as sort of unassuming. I think, I know, actually, we got a bunch of questions from the audience, like pre-event questions on, you know, what is the, like, silver bullet that your query letter, like, you have to attach, and it will it will get your pitch seen and and really read and responded to. Um, 
I mean, did you watch the Instagram live along with the 25,000 other people? How did you decide to write Sia Doan? Um, how did you make that choice to, to bring Temple Folk to Simon & Schuster? So I have an equally <laughs> um, unique and quite strange story. Um, at the time that Yodan announced that he'd gotten this position at Simon & Schuster, I was um, in the middle of uh, a very trying chapter of life. And my sister was my eyes and my ears. I was very much um, in my imagination at that time. Um, and my sister had seen the notification on Twitter. And she texted me immediately and said, Leah, you have to write. And then I followed up and looked and I saw that thousands of people had seen this and had liked it and retweeted it. And I was certain that he would never see my submission, but, you know, wanting to appease my sister, I said, okay, I'll go ahead and submit something. And so I spent the next hour putting together a few of my stories and sent them off. Um, knowing for sure that I would never hear back. After I'd submitted, I then looked at the Instagram live. I hadn't seen it yet. And at that point, I saw that it had upwards of 23,000 views. And again, I was just certain that, you know, he'd never write back to me. But, you know, um, what I told my sister is I'm knocking on every door. You know, I have this dream. I don't have an MFA. I'm just this woman who for long has had a strong desire to write and to write well. And um, it had always been just this, you know, very impractical hope of mine that someday somebody would care about this work that I was doing completely in isolation. Mm. And uh, pardon me, am I talking too much? I am. Um, remember it was a Sunday I was uh, watching the verses Isley Brothers versus um, Earth Wind and Fire team Isley Brothers by the way so <laughs> I was rocking out to the Isley Brothers when I get this notification that Yodan was following me on Instagram and I thought that's strange my life is so ordinary what does he care about me you know my life is so basic and um, as I'm still grooving to um, the Isley Brothers, I look at my email and I see this message from him and it says, I want to be your editor. And I'm thinking, what is happening? <laughs> I, there'd been, I'd been in this fog for so long and it was like the clouds parted. You know, this lifelong dream I had was coming true. So it was just very, very, very special. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I really want this whole story to be adapted into a film, just the like acquiring story. The soundtrack is incredible, all of it. Um, I'm really curious, Eric and Yandown, could you talk a little bit about, a little bit more about submissions and I mean, Eric, like as you were looking through submissions, what, I know there's no formula, but like, what is it that kind of glimmers at you almost and makes you want to read further? Like what really catches your interest? Um, and then, I mean, same question for you, Yadon, but also more specifically, like the, the track you're carving out at Simon & Schuster, the books, those eight to 12 books that you are um, building a universe of. I'd love to hear you both talk about about that uh, if, okay, oh, yeah. I, I think we're, we're all fundamentally readers right like that that that's that's why we're doing this in the first place because we were people who were just people who love to read all the time um so what we bring to the submission process and opening a query letter and beginning to read a submission is not that different than what everybody out there on the zoom call brings to a bookstore right where you walk into a bookstore you flip over a paperback and read the back ad, or you open up a hardcover and read the flap, uh, and you think, is this something that I want to read? Is this not something I want to read, right? So a, a, lo a lot of 
what goes into the query that piques someone's interest is is kind of that. That is, have have you convinced someone standing in a bookstore who's picked up your your book slash manuscript slash query letter? Yeah, this is something that I want to now open up to the first page and have a look at, right? Because that's that's what Yadon's job is and, and Simon Schuster's job is ultimately to create a package out of temple folk that when people walk into a bookstore and pick it up, they want to then take it to the till and bring it home. Um, and that's kind of the writer's job too at, at the first step of the query process, which is to say something about your work and, and speak succinctly but compellingly enough about your work to make the agent just want to read the first sentence, really, mm -hmm. right? It's not that hard just to click onto the Word doc that might be attached. And then, I mean, I've said it before, the first sentence's job is to make you read, want to read the second sentence. And it just kind of goes from there. Mm -hmm. um, and we do this enough. And, and I think this is, I would say this is true for everybody on the call too, that you kind of know when you, you, you've, you've lost your own will and are now doing the bidding of the, of the writer, right? You know, when you've completely surrendered to the intelligence that's created this fictional world, this voice, these characters. And when that happens, then that's when you know you're really onto something. That's, it's the leg shaking thing that Yadon was talking about. Yeah. Um, on that, cause I'll, I'll, I can use this answer to address other people's answers. To the point of what Eric said, like there is no formula, but I do think that there are principles that I look for when I was looking for mm -hmm. submissions. And the reason why I did the video to go back was when I first, got the job I did I posted the uh the assignment every time someone gets hired in these jobs the publicity team releases a press release about the new hire so at first I just posted that and I was like more or less like this this is my job submit and I was getting submissions from like every corner of like the country more or less but there was no like I realized I did not do my due diligence in explaining what I was looking for so I was getting things that I I couldn't even acquire like children's work and, and YA. And I was like, okay, I did not put this out intentionally enough. So the video was also a way to like address and redress like, mm -hmm. okay, I have to let you know what I'm looking for specifically and what I want. Mm -hmm. um, and it was funny because when I did the video, less submissions had come in after than before where it just felt like open submission. Because if you say open submission, someone goes, oh, well, all right, I'm gonna submit. But when I made it very clear that I'm like, no, this is, you know, this is a distinction here between writer and author, right? And when and I want to be clear about like my understanding of the distinction between writer and author. It's like a writer, I think, is someone who looks at the craft of what they do and they tell stories on the page. And it's like that's how they understand everything they're doing. Um, the thing that struck me as a way to address somebody's question here um, about like wanting to see Aliyah's note, Aliyah's note, is when she emailed, when I say it was unassuming, I also want to say it was very intentional. Like she knew exactly who she was and what she wanted and what she was doing with her stories, which you would be surprised, right? I think when people who are writing get so used to their work by themselves, they're so in the world of it that they forget that there's a world beyond what they're writing. And what I mean by that is, is when you're pitching it, they're talking about it as though you're already on their side, as though as an editor, even me loving a project, I have to take that project in and run it through the gauntlet of colleagues who read for me, the marketing team, the publicity team, sales team, the editorial director, depending on a certain level of advance, it goes to the CEO. So you're running through so many people that it has to go through to even get it in house that every question I ask a writer is a question I'm being asked by my colleagues, the question I'm being asked by my sales team, and a question I'm being asked by my publicity team. And so the clearer the vision that a writer has about their, themselves, and that was one of the most impressive things I will say about when I talked to Alia, the way she comported herself was like she had been in this industry before. And what I mean by that is she knew who she was, not just as a writer, but she knew who she wanted to be as an author. She knew she wanted a long career. She knew she wanted to write books. Not She wasn't just focusing all of her creative energies into this one project. She had projects, plural. She And she saw her trajectory. And when someone is that clear-eyed about themselves, there isn't the same, what's the word? The same sort of frantic energy 
that like they have this finite window to fill before they miss their shot, right? I think if you're if you're in sports where like even the best players, the average career is three to five years, that sort of like anxiety that informs that desperation makes sense. But in publishing, we talk about like one of my favorite examples to use is Toni Morrison didn't publish her first novel till she was 40. She had been working at, you know, Random House for nearly 20 years at that point. She doesn't get her first bestseller till 17 years after. So you're talking about a woman whose first book uh, is published when she's 40. That book sells 2,500 copies. She doesn't get her first bestseller till 1987 when she's 57. In between that time, she's written four to five novels. This is how I understand publishing. So like to see that Aliyah was ready, but not impatient. She was like, this is what I have. I know who I am. And I know that what I have to offer is worth what it might take to get there. And I think that that level of just poise, just like I know, like, I know these stories are good, right? And one of the things I will say in these pitches, something I'll say just to give people information, you have writers who have not done their due research on their agents. Um, one of the more, another impressive thing that Alia did, and I think Eric can speak to this too as an agent, was when I asked her, because I want to be clear, when I brought this book home, I was like the talk of the town in the building. It was like, you got your first submission from Eric Simonoff, an exclusive, like, how'd you do it? And it's like, I really can't take credit for any of this, right? No, and that's so not true. What? <laughs> I totally disagree with that. What? I can't take any credit for it. You, you, I, 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 you know, <laughs> Ali came to me to say, hey, this guy, you don't interested in me, we read my stories. Um, but this goes back to, to Alia, you know, the, the, in the conversations we had about what to do with the collection, Alia, I think the, I think the, I don't know whether it was your phrase or my phrase, but we talked about honoring the process. Mm -hmm. We talked mm -hmm. about Yadon's part in, in, in this and his recognition of your ability outside the trappings of MFAs and fancy agents and all that kind of stuff. He saw on the page what you wanted him to see on the page, what's on the page. Um, and that was that was Ali's decision, really. You know, we, we, I was swinging but, it back around to her to say that when I asked her how she found Eric, she said she looked up Edward P. Jones's agent. And this is, comes back to knowing who you are as a writer. She had a she wanted to be associated with somebody who to her, this is the caliber of writer I see myself as. Mm -hmm. And so when writers are querying agents, my question to you is. Are you querying them because they're the best agent? Or are you querying them because you believe that they're the best agent for your work? One of the things I tell all writers to do when they're looking for agents is I tell them, look at five books of the book that your book is like and go on the acknowledgments. That's your yellow brick road. Those books are going to tell you who represents those books. Then subscribe to a publisher's marketplace and look at the deals these agents are doing. Does this agent make a habit of representing the kind of work you do? Or was that work that they did when they represented that work a one shot in the dark? And so what I'm talking about, again, is intentionality, clarity, poise, these things that aren't formulaic, but they're principles. And like those are the principles that I will say came together well yeah. with, this pro with this process. So it, it wasn't like as much as we talk about this, like as a story of exceptionalism, it's anything but that, right? This is really about years of her developing her own craft as a writer. This is years of Eric Simonoff developing his craft as an agent. This is years of me developing my craft as like under being an editor, being someone who like got into Simon & Schuster. And it's like, it converged at a moment that can't necessarily be replicated, but this was all, all of those principles I spoke about previously. Yeah. I wanna actually ask you all to continue chatting about that this idea of honoring the process, the clarity of vision that it really seems like was there from the get-go from this like kind of kismet moment on social media where just like the right link was texted along the right email at the right time. Um, there was a, a question from an audience member, Alia, that I really loved and I'm gonna just read it verbatim um, on the editorial process. Um, and they were curious how you were able to stay firm to your vision for the collection while also being receptive to important feedback that would improve the work. Um, and if I can add on that, it sounds like there were a few stories you 
wrote after the book was sold. And I'm interested how the book, having an editor and agent, like how that might've affected or not affected at all um, those final stories. Well, most of the book was actually written after Temple Folk was acquired. Mm -hmm. Six of the stories, of the 10 stories, six, can I say this stuff? Um, of the 10 stories in the collection, six were done prior to the acquisition. Those were the six that I submitted to Yodan and Eric. Mm -hmm. Four were completed in the last year, but those four were actually the bulk of the book. Um, they're really, really big stories. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I submitted 27,000 words and the final manuscript is upwards of 74. So a huge chunk of writing was done in the last year. And as far as um, navigating the editorial process, I think what helped is that I just had a very strong vision. And I'm also a writer that's just very clear that I'm here in the service to the stories. Writing is not about my ego. It's not about my sense of my own intelligence. It's about wanting to be of service to the characters that I imagine. Mm -hmm. And well, the best, most eloquent story I possibly can tell. Um, and um, that really makes things easy when you don't put your ego into the mix because there's always going to be valuable feedback that you can get from people that you respect. And mm -hmm. I think glue between the three of us is that we have a lot of respect for each other for each other everybody knows their craft very well and mm -hmm. so if I get feedback from Yadon or from Eric I know it's well placed I know it's considered and my mind is just such that I can get out of the way and do the work and mm -hmm. uh, well, that's how we navigated it but but you know to my credit a lot of the work came in really strong I, I must say <laughs> I should say I'm glad you do say and and yeah Don and Eric I'd love to hear I love what Alia just said about working in service to the stories how does that work on your ends like as you are editing Yadon, as you are reading the this I mean incredible bulk of new work that's being written Eric like how are you both on Alia's team in service of the stories as well. Are we looking at each other? Who's one of you, <laughs> a double Dutch thing? I mean, I can speak for myself, like in terms of like, this is where we talk about the larger apparatus that exists outside these craft conversations is the business of it, right? And we're talking about markets and like, let's just think about the fact that like black Muslims have been in this country like Black Americans have been in this country for over 500 years, right? Black Muslims have been in it in this country for over 100 years. And the fact that there's no major literary work where Black Muslims are protagonists, are central figures in literary fiction, to me, it was like, this is a market opportunity also, right? In addition to the craft, this is also high literary craft being brought to a community that has never had that sort of representation in major literary public and in, in the major literary um, world. So I'm also looking at the fact that like, what I think sometimes what happens is there's an over index. And when I say over index, I mean that there's this notion of meritocracy that pervades the culture industry, where it's like, I just have to be the best writer and everything else will take care of itself. What we don't sometimes understand as individual artists is that when you enter a market, you are not just the only writer executing at that high level. There are many writers who are executing at a high level. So when a writer says, I'm a good writer, it's like, that's the that's the, that's the the floor at the level of getting represented by like an Eric Simonoff or getting published by a major literary house or even like an independent house. We expect you to be a good writer, but then it's like, what else after that, right? In addition to you being a good writer, what else are you bringing, not just to, the page, but what are you bringing to the world? And that's what I saw and recognized in Temple Folk was like, there is, while there is no book that does what she's doing for the community she's doing it for, what she's doing on the page is something we've always seen, which is high literary quality. You've seen it in Edward P. Jones, you've seen it in Jumpa Lahiri, you've seen it with Bill Clyde, you've seen it 
with, you know, Disha Filial, you like George Saunders, if you know the short story as a form, she's not doing anything new in the regards of elevating the craft and really showing what the form could do, but who, sh what she's using the craft to do, which is communicate the, you know, the interior and lived experiences of Black Muslims in an imagined way, like that was the unique intersection of like what I saw was the high craft, but the market op and the market opportunity. And that was the mix for me. I mean, as for the editorial process, um, once an author has an editor, I definitely defer to that relationship, but uh, I, I can't help querying, I guess, different lines, different moments, different scenes, mostly just for clarity. Just like, can I, can I see this? Do I understand this? Does this need to be further explained at all? But Ali is not wrong. She hands in really, really strong, really, really clean prose. Um, I love almost everything about my job and I'm very grateful that I get to work in this industry, mostly because of the texts I get to work with, but also because of the people I get to work with. So Alia, you remember this, sometimes you would just call me and say like, hey, I'm stuck on this story. Let me let me tell you what's going on with this story. And then you, I just listen, right? And you would tell the whole story and you'd say like, I'm thinking about, you get to a forked path, right? You're like, I could either go this way or I could go this way. And I'm thinking about going this way. What do you think? And I'd be like, sounds great. <laughs> and that was my contribution, I think. Um, but what a privilege, right? To get to be that close to the creative process by someone as talented as Alia. It's, it's, uh, it's why we wake up in the morning. Yeah. yeah. And definitely, like, I will say, like, waiting for Alia's submissions is like waiting for, like, a new pair of Jordans to drop. Like every time I seen like, oh, this is a, I got, I got this, this is the one story that like took her the longest when it finally came in, I like stopped everything I was doing. And I like, no, I want to read this now. Cause the way she, she talks about things, it's like, so there's, there's writers who talk about their stories as though, again, they're just really consumed by what's inside of it. But like, what I enjoy talking to Aliyah about is that so much of our conversations are about the larger mechanisms that are holding the story together. Like we're talking about these large, you know, philosophical concepts that's almost like math and science more than it is literary and creative, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about timing. We're talking about like, well, why, like if this happened here, how would this happen there? Like our, one of the, my, my favorite, you know, suggestions was there was a story that was happening in third person that she couldn't finish and I was like well what happens if you put this the current uh emotional resonance isn't here in third person put it in first person right and so the stakes of the story it was the same story virtually but when she shifted in first person it opened up for her to finish it right and so being able to talk to a person who really knows their craft that also, as an editor who's managing a list of eight to 12 books a year, as Alia will say that she could trust us with our work, what is equally beautiful is we could trust her with her work, right? Because I can share experiences of like, you're, I'm learning in an editorial meeting that a writer who I signed doesn't know a uh, plot. And so now in addition to editing the book, I have to teach him what plot is. And it's like, oh my God, like, that's a different kind of labor that's added on to what you have to do. So when Aliyah comes in and I don't have to explain things I think I have to explain, I just have to talk about the larger concepts and she'll go back and come back with something even sharper than before. It's like that, you know, to Eric's point, that's why we wake up in the morning. That's why we do this work. I've got, actually, I've got a question for Aliyah, uh, which uh, I'm sometimes asked, uh, how many literary writers of, of that you represent have MFAs? And the answer is like 99%, 98%. I don't know, like so much literary fiction comes out of very traditional MFA track, uh, you know, hidebound kind of system. But Alia, you're, you are self-taught. You taught yourself this form. Um, and we ta we've talked about it a little bit, but how? <laughs> because to Yadon's point, you do understand the mechanics. You understand plot, you understand theme, you understand character, you understand uh, setting. Uh, you understand stakes probably almost more than any recent writer I can think of. So did you engineer, reverse engineer, just read a ton? Like how, how did you come to that understanding of the mechanics of short fiction? 
Well, I just always enjoy the form. I really, really love the form. And I think uh, mastering anything is just about, or the easiest way probably to master anything is just to love it. And um, I didn't start writing short stories by reverse engineering them. I just read a lot of really good fiction and try to cultivate a sensibility that would enable my own skill level to meet my taste, which was always very, very, very elevated. And um, I found my master, my teacher, when I first read Lost in the City. It's just, oh God, that book. To this day, I probably read it 60 times. I've read All Aunt Hagar's Children maybe 15 times. Uh, I just feel in the work of Edward P. Jones that this is somebody that really, really understands the majesty of the Black experience and, and how beautiful it is and how tragic it is. Um, and uh, his work was really all that I needed to learn how to write short fiction and that's really the truth. I just mm. cultivated a sensibility by immersing myself in really excellent work. Good answer. Yeah. Um, I want to shift us over to audience Q&A and I will say at the outset I think we have more questions than we have time but I'm gonna get to as many um, as I can. Uh, I love hearing you talk about craft and the creative process, Ali, and there's a question from Autumn Allen, um, which is for you, saying, if you're working on another book right now, do you have any advice on working on book two while book one is on its way into the world? Maybe also how you're thinking about that, like, shelf you're going to fill with the books you'll be writing. Well, I don't know how my agent's going to feel to hear this, but I think it's the lesson of my life has really been the importance of patience with the work. And um, I'm quite frustrated when people publish before the work is actually ready. I think um, it's, there's so many good books. I don't wanna waste anybody's time with something that's not worth their attention. And that's um, just a personal conviction that I have. And I will take as much time as is necessary to do um, the next book right. I already know what it's going to be. And I want it to be excellent. I want it to be superior to the work that I did in Temple Folk, which is already very, very strong. Um, and I have a, a very strong sense of mission with all of these projects. Mm -hmm. And so it's really following my sense of mission as well as the respect that I have for the reader, the service that a good writer should provide is educating the reader and providing an opportunity to, you know, you want to feel that you're in the hands of somebody that really understands what they're doing and that can lead you through a really gorgeous ex experience. And that's, that's my conviction with the next book. Sounds I'm good to me. Uh, you know, it was ten years between Lost in the City and the Known World, so I, I, I've, I've established that I, I can be patient. <laughs> and we'll be here waiting very excitedly. Um, there were a number of questions that came through about query letters and just the practicality of um, that form, which I know is question a lot of people asked. There was a question from Patricia Young um, saying that she had been told, they had been told to keep the query to 300 words max. I mean, are there any pearls of wisdom, like resources you might be able to share, rules, general guidelines for um, putting together a query letter that is strong? Um, and any of you, whoever wants to hop in. Um, you know, I, I, I think someone also asked, do you have to publish, uh, you know, stories in, if you're if you're sending a collection, or do you have to have? You know, I think any credential that you can offer couldn't hurt. If you have an MFA, mention MFA. If you studied with some published writers, mention who you studied with. If you've published some places, mention that. 
but as I said before, it, re it really comes down to how compellingly you can describe what your work is and, and why your work is. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as capping it at 300 words, I don't think there's a cap necessarily, but I think as with pretty much all writing, we're all super busy. Uh, and and the, the one thing you, you must never ever be is boring. So if it's compelling, it'll get read, whether it's 300 words or 600 words or 1,000 words. It just has to be compelling. Um, the I, I was struck by Yudan's reference to the, the, the sort of simplicity and humility of Alia's approach to him initially. Yeah, don't don't say this is the greatest work of literature ever written and it's going to sell a million copies. Mm -hmm. uh, we we see those and we just delete those uh, because um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's 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 best just to to uh, uh, approach the process with a certain degree of not not so much humility but but um, d directness and, and and understated appreciation for the seriousness of the undertaking. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and I will add to the, in terms of the query, like I can speak to another writer who, another book deal came through, who when she submitted her project, she had done all this work of like, here's the people who I know this book will work. In this state alone, this many people are suffering. Like she really sat with and thought about, again, the life beyond the book, right? And I think that when people talk about the book, they talk about the book in this sort of creative vacuum that like the book alone, and this is the thing coming to Eric's point, when people talk about their books being bestsellers and the greatest, like if anyone knows the history of so many of these books, very few of these books were immediately recognized as the book, right? Like there's a story of Robert Gottlieb when he was at Simon & Schuster, literally begging his publisher to let him acquire Catch-22 by Joseph Heller, right? Like so many of these books that have become the canon were not the canon in the moment. They were books that no one saw, like only one person needed to see in order for it to turn into what it was. So when someone is very, like to, to you know Eric's point, certain that this book is going to do what it's going to do, it puts a pause because it, it says, what it signals to me is like you, a person thinks that everyone's in this business to do the biggest thing, whatever that may look like, as opposed to like the things that align with how we particular what we particularly care about, that editorial sensibility. And so one of the ways I, I answered the question for anybody, if you look at the books that you read and you look at the acknowledgments, if you if you consider yourself a part of this industry, it's like know the players in it. And when I say know the players, who's representing this kind of work you want to do, right? What editors are buying the kind of work you want to do? I, I hear so often from agents that people submit to agents who don't even represent the genre that they do. They just want representation. Right. And so it's like that intentionality, that clarity of vision. I think it comes with comes back to being patient with your own process and not just looking for a book deal. But it's like I'm looking for a career. And then how do you reverse engineer backwards of going like now? What step do I take towards that career versus like thinking any agent who wants to represent you is your agent or any editor who wants to acquire your book and any house that wants to offer you money is your house. It takes some writers who I know their third and fourth book to realize what in some ways Ali is doing with her first, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is the kind of career I want. And so that patience is like, it can't be understated. And I know like when you don't have a book deal, it's like, yeah, whatever, how do I get one? But I can only tell you on the business side of it, this is about so much more than the art and understanding that this is, this is as much of an art, like a science of craft and the art of craft this is also about the business of craft. And this is, and when we talk about what Aliyah brings to the page and to the collaboration as a writer, when I, we talk about the editorial process, this woman had down to almost a science when she could submit things to me. I don't know how many people are editors watching, but you know how, uh, what's the word? Heartening it is to know that if a writer says two weeks, they mean two weeks <laughs> versus like, a writer saying two weeks and then two months later, they still haven't submitted something. Like Alia was, was a queen in her domain of what was going on in her house. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to the associate publisher, when can we expect this? And oh, I can trust that when Alia says she's going to send something, she's going to send it. If she doesn't send it, she'll communicate, hey, this is what's going on. This is what I need. A, a, she's not waiting for me to email her. 
she's openly communicating with me. So like those other skills that aren't as emphasized as like, you just gotta be a good writer. This, she's, this woman has been a joy to work with. Like I can't, and so when it comes to like book number two, Eric, I'm, you know, and we, we, we have that conversation as an editor, I'm gonna advocate for everything this woman needs to be able for us to continue to work together. Because that's also what this is about too, is a professional working relationship. So like, if she was just a really good writer, I always say this, and this is like a sort of Alan Iverson analogy, you have to be so, for you to only be a good writer, your writing has to be so good that you can like under index in every other area, but very few people are ever that good at one thing. So what I appreciate about Aliyah is that she doesn't allow her craft to compensate for her humanity. She doesn't allow her craft to stand in for her professionalism. She comes to the table with all of those things intact. And that is why like, you know, again, anything I can do in, in, for this book, for this, for this writer, I'm gonna do. Yeah. I'm just like so full of gratitude that all three of you are on this call today to hear how you have worked together for the last months is, is really, really beautiful. Um, I have a couple more questions from the audience. Um, I think this one is more directed at Eric and Yadon and it's, um, how have things changed in the submissions world um, since during this COVID continues? Um, you know, what has shifted in terms of what is desirable and what is DOA? Oh, I don't, I don't know that much has changed because of COVID so much, really. Uh, I mean, I think the biggest change that we've seen in the past several years is the huge proliferation of agents. They're just zillions of agents. And I think what people don't realize is that it's a, a, an entirely unregulated industry. Um, anybody who wants to call himself an agent can say, I'm an agent. Uh, there's no licensing, there's no training, there's, you know, the, basically they're, they're, they're minting new agents daily. So getting an agent is not that hard, I don't think. Um, getting an agent who really understands your work uh, and getting an agent who's competent to represent your work is, is another thing. So I think due diligence plays a big part in it. I do find that people are signing people earlier and earlier and earlier because the, prolifer the proliferation of agents means there's more competition among agents for uh, a finite number of really, really gifted and talented writers. And that comes with its own risks too. That is if you sign with someone well before you're actually ready to employ them to sell and market your work, then that relationship can grow stale before you actually even get to the point of finding out whether your agent's you know, compatible with you and, and your work. Um, but I, I don't know, you Don, have you seen much of a difference in the past couple I will, of years? I, I, I will say that, no, it's the same. It's like I'm getting submissions from people who like never heard of their agency and never heard of them which is not in and of itself it means anything but then when you see little things that like signal they don't know much about what they're representing they don't know much about the industry they don't know much about the landscape it really like it just shows you like okay like this is not something any even if anyone can call themselves an agent this is not work that anyone just can pick up without a commitment to the craft Ali are you all right Okay. I don't want to interrupt you. I'm just still reeling from the very kind words you said earlier. Oh, Are okay. You okay, but yeah, but so like that, so that, that, this is that whole thing of like, again, people who took the time to like develop and master their craft. And when I talk about mastery, I'm not talking about you're done and you're complete. It's like, you're always looking to learn from it, right? And so, and knowing that there's, there's always more to do and, and another thing about Aliyah and our editorial process like when she knew that there wasn't an edit she took she didn't take it but if it was sound to her she took it right and it's like that's another thing too I would tell writers is be coachable right like hmm. being in service to the story is not taking ownership like Aliyah never said these are my stories Aliyah said what makes this the best story it can be so it's not me versus her vision. It's like, this is what I think makes this story the best story. We, we did a title change. I made my case with a title change. And she was like, you know what? 
Now that you explain it the way you explain it, I see how that makes for, and she, and this is another thing she did. She goes, I imagine when someone's looking through the index of, this, of the table of contents of all the other stories, and they think about which story they want to read, I can see this, this title sticking out to people, right? Mm -hmm. So she created, she put herself in the empathetic position of the reader and like, what would they, how will they experience this thing? Right. So coming back to the fact that like what Eric said, where readers first is like, sometimes what I can say I encounter is that writers forget at a point that they were readers at one point and that they're still readers and they should still be readers. Mm -hmm. They, they, they talk about their work as like, they forgot, like when you have $25 and there's two books you want, but you can only leave with one that day. And what governs the decision for picking this book over that book, right? Like all of those things inform if a writer is able to put themselves in that position and write from there, I think that that's what creates the connection that writers feel like they're kept out of is like, you know more about what you need just by thinking about the experience that brought you to where you are. Mm. Love that. Um, I have one more question and then I think we are very sadly going to be out of time. Um, can we give our lead the last question? This is, I want this to, can we, do you have one for her? Um, yes, actually. So I will, I will pivot slightly. I was going to ask, um, and it is sort of a question for all of you, but Ali, I'm really interested to hear always um, the books that writers are kind of leaning on like the shoulders of which books you're standing on while you are working on a a certain project so um we've talked about it at the workshop about like again the shoulders the ancestors on whose shoulders a book a book stands and I'd love to hear um if you could talk a little bit about that in terms of like the lineage of temple folk which I I, I mean, I was already excited to read this and see it out in the world, but this conversation, I just absolutely cannot wait for this collection and the books that are to come. Um, but I'd love to hear, what were you reading? What have you drawn from, inspired by? You mentioned some of it already, but any other names, any titles? Well, that's one thing that I am truly proud of. Stylistically, I think the inheritance of this book is hopefully Edward P. Jones. Um, also, I, I just try to write in a very pleasant, readable style. Um, it's something that has the tenor of classic American literature. Mm. And some reference points would be maybe, maybe Richard Wright, maybe... Anne Petrie, you know, uh, just work that's propulsive. Um, mm. And that's not not hard on the reader, not taxing on the eye. Something that can get you to the bottom of the page, but retain uh, some, some literary power. Mm. However, the world making is entirely my own because this work has no precedent in terms of the characterization extracting the metaphors of the nation of Assam, that work had never been done. Mm. And it was entirely upon me to engage in that as an intellectual project. And um, the work hopefully lays a foundation for writers to follow so that they can see, oh, well, this, this was the untapped potential of this region of African-American experience that I can now take in many other cool directions. Um, but I'd like to believe that the work stands on the shoulders of people like Ed Jones. Um, as far as uh, Black Muslim writers, uh, there is someone who influenced me, but he's, um, he's Ghanaian and he writes about um, the Ghanaian Muslim experience. His name is Muhammad Nasihu Ali. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a beautiful book called The Prophet of Zongo Street. It's also a collection of short stories and it makes me really sad that people don't talk very much about it because it's so lyrical, it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. But um, those I would probably say are, are the biggest influences. However, the work of creating this world is really on my own shoulders. Yeah. Can I actually ask a follow-up question to that. It's so, I love hearing you talk about laying these foundation stones for the work that is to come from other writers. And 
again, something we talk about often with our Asian diasporic writers at the workshop is this balance between not like exposing fully the innards of a certain community, but making sure that this community is like fully, completely represented on the page. Um, it's a question we wrestle with quite a lot. And I'm interested to hear if you if you could talk even just a little bit about that, like, what was that like balancing bringing that experience to life and and making sure that as always it was done with care with respect with um yeah the way my brain works I wasn't really thinking about appeasing anyone I just wanted to do do the work the right way mm. and literature put so there's so many rules to the game that make it so that anything that's truly excellent is going to be fair, is going to be balanced. Um, and uh, it wasn't, um, it was interesting because I am no longer a practicing member of the Muslim community that raised me, but the further away I got from the ideology, the more clearly I could see it and the more available it was for me for artistic, you know, manipulation. But the stories came out very tender, even though I'm no longer in that that space, you know, they, they came out full of love, they came out really tender. And so I don't think the writer necessarily has to always have front of mind, you know, what are people going to think and how can I be the best representative? All you have to do is just follow the rules of the game, you know, mm -hmm. the story, there's no, nobody's really ever completely wrong and nobody's completely right, you know. And that'll take care of all of that. <laughs> I love that. That is beautiful. Thank you. Um, I think we are at the end of our time together. Johnny, is that right? Um, I want to, before we close out, though, thank everyone and make sure that everybody has the date, July 4th, 2023, firmly implanted in their brains. That is when Temple Folk will be out yeah. everywhere. Please make sure to pre-order. Wait till y'all see this package, though. When y'all see this 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 visual package, that is the package. This is y'all going. It's it's the only way I can talk about it is that it's it's when you encounter something you know is going to exist for a long time. It's like you've never seen it before, but you feel like you've seen it already. That's the only way I'm gonna talk about it. It's like oh oh, like that's that's going to be the oh. Like that, those three O's in that order. So y'all just be prepared. Mm, so Wonderful. I'm sorry, can I say one last thing? Absolutely. I'm so sorry. Sorry, Johnny. I just wanted to say for the world to know what a joy and a pleasure it has been to work with Yadon and with Eric. Um, you know, it's a business relationship, um, but I care for these people and hopefully, the joy and the affection, you know, translates to the reading experience. So thank to you both. Thank you to Lily. Thank you to Johnny. Thank you to the Authors Guild. Just thank you. Thank you. And, and so many thanks have come in from the audience. I think everyone's really touched by this frank and inspiring talk that we've had today. Um, you know, we cover a lot of stuff about taxes and marketing software, you know, like it, it's nice to have these conversations as well. And I know the audience appreciates it. Um, we'll do another event like this, I think featuring a biography uh, in a month or two. And there's a lot to look forward to, but please you know, check out uh, the Asian American Writers Workshop if you're interested, check out the Authors Guild. Uh, if you join the Authors Guild, you have access to our legal help and things like that. You can also just follow along because almost all of our programming like this is free and public. And we're happy to provide that to every writer who needs it. Uh, Yudan, Eric, and Alia, thank you so much. And thank you, Lily. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.